I think we can get started. So I have one more announcement to make about lunch. Uh, Kristen is saying that um, if you want to have lunch with us today, you should check in with her. And if you also have already uh, signed up for lunch, check in with her and let her know that you're going to be here for lunch. And then if you're not, we can open up some other spaces for people. Great. So I'll just uh, let the panel come up and um, take over from here. Thank you for coming out this morning. Okay. Um, I'm um, Katie Cortese, and I'm going to just give a little um, introduction for the panel, which is basically just to read the title of it. Um, I'm going to sort of leave the interpretation of how the pieces speak to it up to you to discern or um, wrestle with. So um, the title of the panel is uh, The Fragility of Wilderness Being Other in the Wild. All right. Dee Gilson is an assistant professor of English at Texas Tech University. His essays, poetry, and scholarship explore the relationship between popular culture, literature, personal history, and sexuality. His latest books are, I will say this exactly one time, Essays from Sibling Rivalry Press and Crush with Will Stockton from Punctum Books. His first chapbook, Catch and Release, won the 2012 Robin Becker Prize from Seven Kitchens, and his second, Brit Lit, is available from Sibling Rivalry also. Dee currently serves as editor of the journal Lunch. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. Um, this is my dog, Calvin, which I wanted to show a picture of him because I was late this morning, and this, I think, has to do with um, being queer in nature, being other in nature. A in nature being tech terrace, I guess. Um, I went to breakfast with a dear friend who's visiting town, and when I got back, I went to take a shower, and then when I got out of the shower, I heard a, a banging on my door. And so I went to answer it in my towel, and there's a drunk frat boy at my door. I'm like, and he's looking for his friend who lives next door, and I'm like, it's nine o'clock in the morning and you're wasted I'm like what is going on here so I'm trying to get him next door and as um, he's talking to me and trying to tell me what happened to him last night and I'm like I don't care um, my dog Calvin runs out through my legs takes my towel with him from around my waist and runs out in uh, the neighborhood so I spent the next hour chasing him down and I will get an essay out of that I'm sure but he is safe now um, and the essay I'm reading today, which is called On Walking, uh, Calvin is not in it, but he is somewhat the result of this essay. Um, I adopted him from the couple uh, that is at the center of this essay. Um, so this is On Walking, and it has an epigraph from Wendell Berry. Running or walking, the way is the same. Be still, be still. Not paying attention, I have walked into a river and a concrete stairwell and a parade of four-year-olds marching out of preschool, linked with rope as if they were a chain gang en route to Oz. Drunk, I have walked through a screened-in porch and on top of a Volkswagen Beetle and into the fountain at the Missouri State House in Jefferson City. In a home video from 1988, I am four and wearing a pull-up diaper with cherry red Justin boots. My mother holds the camera as I sashay towards her, left hand on hip, right flipping in a beauty queen wave. I sing, these boots are made for walking, and that's just what they'll do. I will write this from the screened-in porch of Will and Howard's home in upstate South Carolina. Will and Howard will not be there, but their three dogs will be. Hobbs, the Alpha, keeping watch over his backyard kingdom from the corner. Tojo, the eldest, inside where the AC hums to life every time the sun breaks through the oak canopy. And Milton, my favorite, the basset hound name for the Renaissance poet whom Will studies, alternatively drooling asleep at my feet or trying to nudge his way onto my lap. Inside the house, Will's menagerie of fish swim circles in five tanks, much to Howard's consternation, come resignation, come now bemusement. 
While they are gone, I will feed the fish and walk the dogs, and if needed, mow the yard. I will cook and not go anywhere in the car Will and Howard have left behind, because it is a stick shift, and I do not know how to drive one. I will bike into town where there is a gym and coffee shop, or walk. Will and Howard will escape these days in Alaska. Four months ago, they became foster parents to Caden, a boy from Ohio, with the intention of adopting him by the end of summer. But because all of us are haunted, Caden needed help neither Will nor Howard nor the state of South Carolina could provide. Ohio Child Services called Caden back in the moment that is, na- that is now is a queer grief for a boy that is not dead and yet is no longer here. In his poem, Reaching Around for You, D.A. Powell addresses a boy in an orchard. I do not mind you closing your own eyes, reclining, summoning the image of a lover put away, because virtue is hardly what either of us saved from our separate, desperate beginnings. Though I am here because I care for my friends, I am also here to grieve, it strikes me. My mother's bout with leukemia, my sister's worsening multiple sclerosis, another brother's death. Like Will and Howard to Alaska, like D.A. Powell to the orchard, I have come here to be alone in the country, to grieve and to walk. In Old English, walk from the Middle Dutch and Low German walken means loosely to roll, as in tossing water, one use, or another, kneading bread. In the Miller's Tale, Chaucer favors the former, Old Noah's flood came rolling like the sea, line 3616. I quite like this antiquated turn, walking like the sea. I think of my brother, Marty, stepping out of his bass boat and onto a log which I, only six, could not see just below the surface of Table Rock Lake. Marty walking away from the boat and me thinking him some sort of prophet. Until he fell with a whoosh off the end of the log, until we both laughed our asses off. A fish walks into a bar. The bartender says, what do you want? The fresh croaks, water. Perhaps my origin story is the story of the grief of others. I am the youngest of eight children, yes, but my siblings are all half. My sisters Dyla and Starla are from our father's first marriage. Marty, Carla, Randy, Mike, and Jennifer from our mothers. Dwayne, my father, spent his Air Force career married to Ginger. Because my father rose quickly through leadership training in veterinary school, he and Ginger drove beautiful cars and had a house full of Ethan Allen furniture. Because my father spent years away from home during the 60s and 70s, stationed in Vietnam and Okinawa, then Puerto Rico, Ginger cheated on him with my uncle and, as legend goes, my grandfather. Beverly, my mother, was married at 17 to a man named Marvin. In the end, Marvin molested my oldest sister and beat my mother. At nine, I found a police photo of her face, all dried blood and freshly blooming bruises, which she kept locked in the safe in her closet behind a pile of Dooney and Burke purses. Though I don't know if this specific memory is real, I know it must be, because this is a scene I will see played on, played on repeat through elementary school and junior high, when I would sit in the kitchen doing homework as my mother bore dirty dishes clean at the sink, humming Patsy Cline. I go out walking after midnight, out in the moonlight, just like we used to do. I'm always walking after midnight, searching for you. In Washington, D.C., I also do not have a car. This past May, it was stolen. Driven by three teenagers from Columbia Heights, our northwest neighborhood, to Brookland, their northeast one. Drunk, they jumped my Jeep Cherokee onto a sidewalk, hitting first a 14-year-old girl and then crashing into a nearby tree. The girl was walking to 7-Eleven for a slushie. She died immediately, the police tell me at the station, where I am accidentally left in a room with her grieving mother, who invites me to the funeral we both know I will not attend. The insurance company gives me a rental car until a settlement is reached. I drive it 40 miles into Maryland to collect whatever is left in the glove compartment. Mixed CDs from ex-boyfriends, a gift card to Barnes & Noble. 
It all seems so trivial or distant, what I am doing, snapping pictures of the Jeep as my father has instructed, finding a spot of smeared blood on the front bumper. I do not replace the car. I deposit the insurance check and take to walking. During chemo, my mother uses a wheelchair and calls to say, this is going to kill me. I text her statistics on walking to brighten her day. In the United States, walking is 36 times more deadly than driving, 300 times more deadly than flying. Similarly, my father takes to calling my mother Lieutenant Dan after his favorite character from his favorite movie, Forrest Gump. Every day here in South Carolina, I walk four miles to the gym as Howard's cherry red Mini Cooper sits idly in the driveway. Quickly, I begin to think of this walk as something born out of more than necessity. Though raised a Pentecostal, I am an atheist now with a recent, already passing, interest in Buddhism, less for its religiosity than its philosophical mores, which are so antithetical to my natural, impatient, controlling tendencies. The Buddha is thought to have said, no one saves us but ourselves, no one can and no one may. We ourselves must walk the path. I am trying, mostly in vain, to not roll my eyes at shit like this. The walk begins with a steep hill that peaks and descends from the scattering of houses that line Woodland Circle, pouring out onto Pendleton Road, which climbs west into Clemson via a slow, steady incline. Perhaps I feel accomplished taking this walk, like Thoreau in his 1862 two essay walking where he claims every walk is a sort of crusade preached by some Peter the hermit in us to go forth and conquer this holy land from the hands of the infidels. As I walk I listen to NPR reports on the Israeli carpet bombing of Palestine and grow frustrated there is little I can do about this. I sweep the headphones from my ears and stuff them into my pockets. Soon a black Mercedes stops and honks at me. Want a ride into town, the driver asks, through the open sunroof. Sorry, the window's broken. Because he rarely had a legal driver's license and often pawned cars for drug money, my brother took to hitchhiking through the small towns dotting the Ozarks, places with names like Miller and Crane and Shell Knob. If you ever want to try it, Marty told me when I was about 10, just take stock of who's offering a ride. I notice this Mercedes is missing a bumper and a rearview mirror. I notice that its tire is a spare and that its driver is black. When I say, no thanks, I'm enjoying the walk, I hate that he may think I don't want to take a ride from a black man in a beat-up Benz. I hate that I noticed he was black, registered this, and that the ghost of my brother, a racist amongst other things, will never stop haunting. Whatever, the driver shouts, pulling back onto the road. This is not the only ride I will turn down on my walks into town, and I can only guess this is because my body is a body marked as harmless. With my beard shaved and my skinny shorts and my retro hip backpack, not to mention my whiteness, I probably seem like a college boy trekking to campus. Don't you have a car, one woman asks with concern, her kids watching Finding Nemo on tiny televisions in the back of her minivan. When Leonard Wolf expressed concern to his wife regarding her long walks, Virginia replied, to walk alone in London is the greatest rest. I walk across a bridge over a muddy creek and think about bodies being where and doing what they are not supposed to, how this might be some essence of queerness, and how some of my favorite films are road trip movies with women at their center. Boys on the side, Thelma and Louise, Little Miss Sunshine. For many gay men, to be gay is to be cosmopolitan and hold a disdain for nature, which is maybe why I feel queer both in D.C., where I live in a world of such gay men, and in these rolling hills, the place of my youth, the place I can't help but return to again and again, the South Carolina not so unlike my Missouri. I step into the ditch, pull down the branch of a towering shrub, and smell its fuchsia flowers until bees begin to swarm. These shrubs are everywhere here, and they lined my grandparents' homestead along the Gasconade River. I should know what they are, but I don't. Pulling my iPhone from my pocket, I snap a picture and upload it to Instagram, asking, can anyone identify these? Lori, a lesbian who grew up in Mississippi, responds almost immediately, crepe myrtle. 
my southern lady flower lessons finally come in handy. By the time I reach the gym, I am drenched in sweat and ready for a shower. Unlike Thoreau, I'm not sure I've conquered anything beyond acquiring the colloquial genus of a pink roadside flower. After Patsy Cline died in a plane crash 90 miles outside Nashville on March 5, 1963, her grief-stricken friend June Carter was unable to attend the funeral. The two women loved each other so deeply the love became perhaps like the complicated relationship one might have with a sibling. Both wrote of this tumultuous love, and various other sources, from Johnny Cash to Loretta Lynn, have corroborated the sentiment. The year before the plane crash, Carter told Klein she was towing a dangerous line, taking up with married men in the small world of country music. Klein called Carter a hypocrite, asking, what exactly do you think it is you're doing with Johnny? I do not bring this up to hypothesize why Carter didn't attend Klein's funeral. From all the reading I've done, it seems they had reconciled and slipped into old ways by that point. But I do bring it up to say, sometimes those closest to us are capable of cutting deep with complicated motive, simultaneously pure and dark, loving and loathing. While their friends attended the funeral, June tasked herself with taking care of Patsy's young children. This I can certainly understand, a desire to do in the time of grief. In the years before Marty, my brother, committed suicide, he kept a room at our house, where he'd stay as he tried to kick the methadone habit born out of his methamphetamine dealing habit. In the months before he died, Marty seemed on the mend. He was laughing again, a boisterous laugh I also have, and working construction with our brother Randy and my father Duane. The last time I saw Marty, we fought. I called him white trash. He called me faggot. A week later, Marty was dead, and we would learn just how adept he'd become at hiding his slip back into the hell of hard drugs. I refused to go to my brother's funeral. In the weeks that followed, my mother in bed, my father absent in memory, I took to walking to the grocery store, asking for cardboard boxes, packing Marty's things, clothes spattered with the paint of a carpenter, and albums, mostly ACDC and stacking these boxes in a corner of our tool shed. Will and Howard's home is nothing astonishing, a split-level ranch on a forest road outside of Pendleton, South Carolina, about four miles from Clemson University, where Will teaches and Howard has a law practice. The house itself, four bedrooms, two bathrooms, basement rec room, a 125-gallon fish tank anchors one wall. While Will and Howard are in Alaska, I feed these fish daily and think how this might be one manifestation of love. Today, I have been reading on their back porch Cheryl St. Germain's newest book, Navigating Disaster, 16 Essays of Love and a Poem of Despair. Cheryl writes often of New Orleans, her homeland, but this collection of essays, she explains, begins in a place like New Orleans of extremity and strong personality. Southeast Alaska, where I traveled alone a few years ago, she says, because it seemed in some ways so far away as I could get from Louisiana, and at a time I needed to put distance between myself and my family. Will and Howard have traveled to Alaska too, I suspect, for many of the same reasons, to be together in a place that is not this home of a family fractured. I have traveled to Will and Howard's home to care for the dogs and fish, certainly, but also to mourn a complicated year for my own family. Tonight, reading in the yellowing light of early evening, I hear a bird cooing from the pine tree, a bird whose call I recognize from the few hunting trips I took with my brothers. It is the morning dove. I open my laptop and confirm this on YouTube, abundant in both the Carolinas and the Ozarks. It is the bird my brothers hunted, but I refused to shoot as a child. My brothers took to calling me warden after the song Folsom Prison Blues, where Johnny Cash sings, when I was just a baby, my mama told me, son, always be a good boy, don't ever play with guns. When Marty chose to kill himself, he did it with a 22 gauge shotgun propped on one foot so the other foot could tow the trigger, the barrels resting in his open mouth, not unlike the kiss of a beloved. Descartes walks into a bar. The bartender asks, can I get you a drink? Descartes replies, I think not, and disappears. In Middle English, 
walk shifts to its present use, to move about, to journey. In his series of sonnets, The Visions of Petrarch, Edmund Spencer tells of his muse. On herbs and flowers, she walked pensively. In her 1788 novel, Emmeline, Charlotte Turner Smith muses on her heroine. Mrs. Mowbray was walked out, as was her custom. Very early, no one knew whither. In 1974, Audrian Rich amuses a lover. Walking the city of love, so cold we warmed our nerves with wine at every all-night cafe. I used to beg, Dad, can we take a walk? I never knew why he answered, walking is for girls. My father and I, we hiked mountains, we paddled rivers, we ran bases. At night, we might exercise the dogs. The four seasons were wrong, my father might say. One cannot walk like a man. Like its songbook, our culture also contains many walking films. Like walking songs, many of these films revel in grief, often masked in the form of quest. What is grief if not part of a quest? Released in Technicolor on the first day of 1939, the most famous walking movie must be The Wizard of Oz, where four unlikely friends seek out the thing they have lost. Because their budget precluded horses, 1975's Monty Python and the Holy Grail brings us a group of knights trotting along English roads as if on horseback, followed by a man banging together coconut shells. This century brings us the Lord of the Rings trilogy, which feels, in my humble opinion, like a 47-hour walk through some boring woods that are supposed to seem harrowing. The most atrocious walking movie, however, has to be 2002's A Walk to Remember, though perhaps it captures the walking grieving compendium best. On the film's IMD, IMBD website, Scott of Milwaukee gives this synopsis. In a coastal North Carolina small town in the mid-1990s, a boy, Landon, from the popular but troubled, undirected group of students gets busted, and for punishment, you guessed it, has to do community service, which includes the school's spring play. This throws him in with the minister's daughter, Jamie, you guessed it, the mousy, seemingly awkward, yet beautiful girl with an angelic heart, and she sings, too. They grow hesitantly closer than their previous adversarial relationship as old bonds are tested and new awarenesses are inspired. A couple twists occur as the story concludes." End quote. I hate to ruin it, but the twists center around two revelations. First, Jamie, played by none other than the pop star Mandy Moore, brings Landon, an admittedly handsome, if not tiresome, Shane West, back to the most banal, secularized form of Jesus-loving under a soundtrack chock full of Christian rock bands like Jars of Clay and Switchfoot. Second, we come to find out Jamie, whose darkening eyeshadow denotes her growing fertility through frailty, not fertility, throughout the film, is dying of leukemia. By the time this is revealed, however, Landon is in love with Jamie and she him, so they decide, as any sensible high school seniors do, to get married. A phantasmagorical ceremony follows, performed by Jamie's minister father, during which Jamie wears her own dead mother's wedding dress. Jamie's walk down the aisle becomes one of the many walks prominent in the movie, all of which we are led to believe are ones to remember. In the most memorable, the film's penultimate scene, we find Landon, four years older and now on his way to medical school, walking through a beachside nature preserve where he and Jamie went on their first date. Landon walks then to Jamie's father's door, whining that Jamie didn't get to finish her bucket list, topped by the dream, witness a miracle. I'm sorry she never got her miracle, Landon says, prompting the father to conclude, she did, it was you. At this point, I fully expected Jamie to leap out of the closet a la Christ's resurrection, but no, Landon just walks away and the movie ends. Unlike walk, the Middle English verb grieve is simply from the French grever to put a strain upon, which is itself simply a derivative of the Latin gravare, meaning heavy. In Wycliffe's Bible, 1382, Jesus comes upon his disciples asleep in the garden with heavy, grieved eyes. And Ephstam came and found in him sleeping, for signed in wherein garden. Three centuries later, a common usage was grieve as in assault. In his 1651 Leviathan, Thomas Hobbes contends, nature hath armed living creatures, some with teeth, some with horns, and some with hands, to grieve an enemy. 
Likewise, the English poet William Copper queerly predicts Sarah Palin's sense of humor in 1782. A Christian's wit is inoffensive light, a beam that aids but never grieves the sight. But this use of grieve is outward, not the use most common today. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, beseeches King James 1611 translation of Ephesians. In 1667, Milton tells how God grieved at his heart when looking down he saw the whole earth filled with violence. In his 1860 commentary, The Minor Prophets, Oxford's Dr. Edward Bouvier Pousset claims, the Holy Spirit they have grieved away. Somewhere we stopped grieving God. In his 1951 Villanelle, Dylan Thomas posits, wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learned too late they grieved it on its way, do not go gentle into that good night. Matthew Dickman's 2008 poem, Slow Dance, replies, there is no one to save us because there is no need to be saved. I am not sure if this is comfort, but I know Hobbes needs a long walk tonight after two days of rain, that I need the unresolve of a poem, of walking, of grieving, of this dog pawing my leg, warning he will piss all over the linoleum again if we do not get moving. Thank you. So last, but certainly not least, my colleague Katie Cortese is the author of Girl Power and Other Short Stories, and Make Way for Her and Other Stories, um, just out from University Press of Kentucky. Her prose has appeared or is forthcoming in such journals as Indiana Review, Blackbird, Gulf Coast, Wigleaf, The Baltimore Review, and elsewhere. She holds a PhD from Florida State and an MFA from Arizona State, and teaches in the creative writing program here at Texas Tech where she serves as the fiction editor for Iron Horse Literary Review. So I'm going to read today a, um, the title story of my, uh, the book that came out in February. It's called Make Way for Her. Um, so I'm going to skip a little part in the middle, and I'll give you a brief summary. I don't think you'll miss too much. There's an epigraph to this story from the Sierra Club. Early inhabitants dubbed the springs strange and mysterious waters, a seemingly accurate name because in some locations spring water appears somewhat magically from the ground, runs downstream for several yards, and then disappears mysteriously below the surface again. Florida's Cool Springs and Wild Rivers, sierraclub.org. Last week, my teenager's best friend died after taking a pill she thought was Molly a pure form of the active ingredient in ecstasy. It was a pink pill stamped with a tiny imprint of a heart, my teenager told me in the ER, where I had been summoned at 2.15 in the morning. My teenager had also taken one of the pills, she told me, in the waiting room, all her limbs folded at their creases in a way that turned her body to envelope, a smooth and private receptacle neatly concealing an unknown number of luminous sins. She had thrown it up, thank God, along with the Niswa salad we'd shared before she left for the concert. Too many vodka Red Bulls, she told me without shame, wheedled out of too many hopeful of age men. We should still get you checked out, I told her, the scuffed leather purse on my lap waiting me to the seat in the room where we waited for Kendra's parents. They lived all the way across town in a graceful neighborhood shielded on all sides by live oaks and Spanish moss. My teenager switched the set of her crossed arms over her bird bone chest. She wore her father's old army jacket, a covering fetched from the car when I saw the way she shivered in her sequin top beneath a framed print of Starry Night. The last time we shared this waiting room, two years ago, I'd been cradling her on my lap. She'd gotten down to 82 pounds and had passed out, hitting her head on the coffee table. We were past all that now. It came up whole, she said. I remember thinking, there goes 50 bucks, literally down the toilet. <laughs> Another mother might have forced her to the admitting nurse, secured a curtain gurney, begged for a talk screen, a stomach pump. But I believed her. She had not lied about the concert, after all. I'd let her go, even though it was 17 and up. I wasn't even angry about the drinks. At least she'd told me. Secrets were a bad sign. Secrets led to skipping dinner because she already ate. They led to three exorbitant weeks at Canopy Cove with equine therapy and 24-hour supervision. And my teenager did not shake or twitch or sweat now as her friend had done before the ambulance was called. 
My teenager picked at her purple painted nails and did not cry because the death was occurring out of sight in another realm of reality that would have no bearing on her life until the Wednesday wake, the stairs in the halls, the cell phone mute on her hip. I'm going to skip a couple pages where um, the father and mother try to cheer up the teenager and fail in various ways. Um, so the mother decides to take her to a nearby natural springs. At Starbucks, I get her favorite tea, green tea smoothie, but she just stares out her window, palms up in her lap like a Buddhist monk in prayer. Most of the leaves over the tunneled canopy roads are still green. When we pass the farmer's market in the chain of parks running like an emerald vein across Tallahassee's belly, the car fills with the burned sugar smell of kettle corn. In her pigtailed single digits, my teenager's favorite place on earth was a mile-long spring in Wakulla County where alligators sunned on muddy banks 100 yards from the roped-off swimming area and where all manners of egrets and spoonbills and moorhens and warblers nested and fed and fought in the underbrush and where in the spring manatees mugged for the tour boats in water clear enough to make out every dip and ridge of the weed-dotted silty bottom. It's too cold to swim, she says, when I take the last turn before the springs. The boats run all day, I say, careful not to whoop or grin at her first word since the night Kendra collapsed at the moon and the band just kept on playing. We'll take a tour. It's a weekend, so the pavilions overflow with birthday parties on the wide lawn between the lodge and the spring. Grills sizzle with sausages and caramelizing onions smelling of a county fair. Kids run and turn handsprings, chasing each other beneath the faded sign touting one of the park's archaic attractions, Henry the Pole Vaulting Fish, done in kitschy 50s style. Balloons anchored to picnic tables jostle in the breeze like bubbles in a glass of champagne. There are 20 minutes until the next tour begins, so we park ourselves on a bench in the loading dock with a dozen other passengers, watching kids wade on the other side of the fence where the water's green silk nibbles at a white sand shore. One little boy, about four, has his jeans rolled to mid-thigh and shivers visibly, lips edged in dusky blue as he cups what he can of the spring and flings it at an older girl, his sister maybe. As we watch, she digs a piece of driftwood from the muck and uses it to scoop up double the water his little hands can hold. When was the last time we were here? I asked my teenager, hoping for more words. She too watches the children play. Their parents are not obvious on the small beach. So much time passes that I touch her shoulder. Even after all her progress, it's nothing more than a knob of bone beneath a crepe paper thin t-shirt. Was it your birthday? She shrugs that compact shoulder, then brings up the cuff of the Leon High sweatshirt looped around her waist to jab at one of her eyes. It comes away with two perfect circles of wet. It was warm, I say, talking myself into the memory. I got a milkshake in the lodge. The kids have stopped splashing now. The little girl has run out of the water. She has been holding up her dress, and now when she lets it fall, she's almost dry, good as new. But the little boy wraps himself in an imperfect hug, blue jeans heavy with dark, wet, feet powdered above the ankle with white sand. I'm standing before I realize it, unzipping my sweatshirt to toss it over the fence when a woman in short white shorts crosses the beach. Soup's on. Come and get a plate, Daryl, she says, and he waddles faster, chasing her back to the biggest pavilion. Mom, my teenager calls from behind me. I force my fingers to release the fence's black bars, boats loading. Lucky if he doesn't catch pneumonia, I say, as we follow the others down the mental ramp, which sings with the rhythm of our steps. The sky overhead is perfectly white, unmarked. So now you're a doctor? My teenager walks before me, hair cordoning off the sides of her face like blinders. She was up to 100 pounds at her physical last month, happier than I'd ever seen her, buoyed by a new love of music and singing in the choir where my husband Ray takes her to mass. Of course not, I say. Heat rushes to my jaw. In the hospital's waiting room, my teenager asked if Kendra suffered or if it was like going to sleep. She asked if I believed in heaven. I told her I was just a secretary, going on 20 years in the dean's office, not a doctor. I said there were things it might be better never to know. Now I say, I don't have to be a doctor to know it's too cold to be messing around in the water. You said it yourself. She relapses into silence and steps from dock to flat-bottomed boat, finally sitting on the right side halfway back behind the driver so she can look into the dense growth at the water's edge where snakes and gators and cooters and the occasional deer haunt the banks. I slide in next to her, studying her perfect ear studded with three silver balls, the metallic red of her flyaway hair. 
Tomorrow she'll sing of Christ risen at Good Shepherd, but today she'll sail with me through a green cathedral where the fallen log gives rise to the mushroom that will feed the squirrel destined for the belly of a water moccasin. It's the only kind of heaven I know. It was too thick to drink, I say, remembering the Oreo milkshake from our last visit, the chunks that clogged my oversized red straw. I had to suck so hard I got dizzy, remember? Then you tried and your face almost turned inside out. My teenager is shaking her head as the boat backs out and the driver guide begins his spiel. Welcome to Wakulla Springs, home of Tarzan and the creature from the Black Lagoon, preserver of mastodon, bo mastodon bones and whatever lies 190 feet down on the floor of its ancient basin. I went and got you a spoon, she says, fighting the way her lips want to curve and part and spread into a smile. Take note, ladies and gents, the guide drones of the osprey nest up ahead. She knows my father died when I was young enough for my memories of him to end at the shoulders, though by all accounts he was not a tall man. I've brought my teenager here to remind her that even in death we are in life and that the best way to honor the dead is to live full lives ourselves. In our memories we bear them with us. When my father died, that was the path my mother chose. It's always made more sense to me than an ongoing toga party in the sky. Sweetie, I say, and tuck a hank of her red hair, chestnut brown beneath all that dye behind her studded ear. I know how hard this week has been. Her eyes are liquid brown, a color she longs to change with contacts, violet in two years when she turns 18. Her lashes grow wet as I watch. Her mouth opens, but just then the guide throws the engine in reverse and brings the boat to a standstill. I'm nodding at my teenager. Go on, please go on. But she's turning, looking out her side of the boat where the other passengers have clustered to stare open mouth at a gator, a relatively small bull animal, only 12 feet, the guide says, pointing out the splintered shaft of an arrow emerging from its hide, the remains of a failed assassination. The gator, too, is open mouthed. Take a good look, folks, the guide intones. These guys are secretive about hunting. Twelve years I've sailed this river and I've never seen one take prey. We watch the gator, camouflaged by the bank's leafy expanse of fern and bald-topped cypress knees, as the gator watches us, great snout agape, dull white teeth, stalactites opposed to stalagmites in a pink cave that hides within it, it seems, a second mouth, delicate, vulnerable, a pale silk purse to keep safe all struggling deposits. And its prey, an orange-beaked moorhen, ducking its head beneath the surface among a stand of reeds, oblivious to danger in its hunger. We'll give it another minute, the guide says, voice taut with the triumph of presenting us this tableau. These guys will spend hours sometimes just like this, waiting to spring, to attack, to strike, to feed. Whatever the guide says next is drowned by the single thrust of the creature's massive tail, the resulting wave, the smack of its spring-loaded jaw. The sound my teenager makes is half gasp, half sob, backing into me so my arms can cross ineffectually over her, at last holding her breakable body against my chest. Her breath hitches there, back rising and falling against me, stuttering like the boat's engine roaring to life beneath us. I'm holding her tight, rocking us side to side, peering over her shoulder when I see it. The moorhen, jigging out of the reeds, head bobbing, candy corn beak parted to issue a shrill warning. It got away, I say, pointing to the creature. Look, sweetie, it's fine. The gator hovers now, nostrils and eyes showing through the thin scrim of water, scaly back like a mat of braided weeds stretching out behind. Looks like it's a lucky day for everyone but the gator folks, the guide says into his microphone. My teenager's breath has slowed now, and she moves politely out of my grip. The boat slinks along the bank as mullet flash out of the water alongside us in little silver commas. I can feel the grief still inside her, an anchor buried in mud. That was something, I say. It was my birthday, she says, and I can almost smell the, dry, the spring drying on her skin the last time we were here. She'd been jumping from the diving tower in a bikini that stood out yellow against a blue screen of sky. We went to the lodge after she dried off. She and Kendra, who'd worn a red one-piece, black braids coiled in an elegant heap on her head. You had a brownie sundae, I say, and she had a banana split. My teenager finishes for me, one hand, so small, all bones, rising to grip the rail. I'm so, so sorry, sweetie, I say. Please, tell me what I can do to help. She shakes her head, mouth pressed to a thin pink line. God, Mom, she says, hand now tiny fists in her lap. We took it once before, and it was fine. This time, it wasn't. End of story. The boat enters the final green corridor, returning to the dock. Life teams on either side, ruffling the leaves of the cypress trees, burrowing into loam, ribboning underneath us. 
As is her habit at this point in the tour, she leans over the edge of the boat while we glide toward the deepest part of the spring. If this were a sunny day and the water clear enough, we'd be able to see the caves ringing the bottom where 10 million gallons of water flood into the basin each hour, every drop carrying along infinitesimal grains of Florida's limestone foundation, slowly undermining the solid seeming ground where we build our homes, where we let our children run barefoot across green lawns. Today, the water surface is a blank silver. You and dad should try it sometime, she says. In the thickening mist, the diving tower is abandoned. You don't think, you just are. You love everyone, and everyone is beautiful. The guide pilots the boat expertly back to the dock where we will disembark, and my teenager burrows into her sweatshirt. We emerge into a light rain, and her uncovered hair fills with diamond flecks. We walk past the deserted beach toward the emptying pavilions. I try to imagine my Raymond on ecstasy. He might like it, actually, if he didn't have a chance to brace himself against it. When we met, he would liked his weed. I'd been too focused on the science behind the drug to let it in, though. I'd try to chart the dopamine flood, map the damage to my gray matter, analyze all that could go wrong. When my father died, I tell her, everyone said it happened for a reason, part of his unknowable plan. My mother didn't accept that. We had to find our own way through. I guess you do, too. At the largest pavilion, most of the balloons have burst and hang down from their strings like strange withered fruit. A few adults bend over picnic tables, collecting plates littered with cake crumbs. The woman in the white shorts sits at one table, facing out, the little boy from the beach bundled in a plaid blanket and balanced on her lap, fast asleep there. She rocks him absently, stealing glances at his thin, slack-jawed face. The currents that feed the spring run under their feet and mine under those of my daughter in her checkered slip-on shoes. You should know I'm going to do stupid stuff sometimes, she says, my teenager, hands deep in her sweatshirt pockets, but I promise not to try to make the same mistake twice. Every so often in this water-rimmed state, the ground crumbles beneath our feet, draining lakes and swallowing houses, plucking sleepers from their beds even as they dream. I'm starving, I say. The urge to fill myself, to weigh myself down, is sudden and strong. Her face is turned down to her cell phone, which lights at the touch of her thumb. She laughs at something she reads there, then shakes the hair out of her face to look at me. We could stop for lunch if you want, she says. I kind of feel like pizza. I pretend to consider while she digs white earbugs out of her pocket and plugs them in one at a time, beginning to nod to some music I can hear only as a distant whine. In a moment, it has taken her over. She spins in its embrace, eyes closed as she mouths something along with the singer, twirling in the rain, expecting the world to make way for her as it always has, trusting that it always will, lucky that this time it does.